We're going to take you to some brand new video right now of the arrest that happened about five minutes from where I'm standing uh, from the police department. The arrest happening on North White Street in Wake Forest this morning around eight o'clock this morning. James Cook was driving by and he saw the SWAT team, uh, different law enforcement walking Thomas McDowell out of his home. He then contacted Eyewitness News to share that video and neighbors we spoke with right next door here tonight were just dumbfounded to learn that he was living here right next door. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries, where we discuss all things true crime. Today, we're doing a cold case solved roundup. I feel like in the last month or so, there have been so many cold cases solved announcements, which is amazing, and my list is getting super full, so we will just gather up all these recent solved cases and dive in. But first, I would like to thank the sponsor of this video, BetterHelp. More on that in a minute, but let's get into it. Number 1. Janet Love For almost 36 years, the mysterious murder of a Bedford, Texas woman has now been solved. In 1986, 32-year-old Janet Elaine Love was a ticket agent for Delta Airlines. When she didn't show up for work on April 24th, two of her colleagues went to her apartment off of L. Don Dodson Drive to check on her. Inside the apartment, they found Janet's body. She had been sexually assaulted and shot. Investigators followed up on possible leads for years after Janet's death, but could never identify her killer. They were, however, able to collect a DNA profile from samples found at the crime scene and entered evidence into the FBI Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, in hopes of finding a match to a suspect, but it came up empty. As technology improved, so did investigators' chances of solving the decades-old cold case. In late 2020, a Texas Department of Public Safety grant called the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Program gave Bedford Police the funding and resources that would change everything. Investigators got to work bringing in a genealogist and using public records to establish a family tree for the suspect based on the DNA profile collected from the crime scene. They were able to determine the suspect's name and reached out to his relatives to confirm the DNA match via kinship analysis completed by the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification. In September, they were able to ID Jeanette's murder, Ray Anthony Chapa. Chapa lived less than a thousand feet from Janet, a neighboring apartment complex, but had no known connection to her. He died in January 2021 from a terminal illness. Investigators have connected Chapa to additional sexual assaults in North Texas and are working with the FBI to uncover other potential offenses. Jeanette's sister, Rebecca, remembers her as someone who loved to joke around and make people laugh. She hopes the other family members of Chapa's victims find peace and closure. They all deserve to feel some closure and some sense of justice in this, and I hope they get that. I'm very thankful that she wasn't forgotten. Number 2. Gregory Bender In February of 2018, Patrick De La Cerda was gunned down at his home in Deltona, Florida. The 25-year-old was newly engaged to his girlfriend, Videa Devani, and the two were excited to start their life together, especially after the tumultuous relationship Videa had with her ex-boyfriend, Gregory Bender. Fidea had broken up with Bender, a wealthy hedge fund manager, after discovering he had a wife. Though he claimed the marriage was a business arrangement made so the wife's child could attend school in a specific district. After Bender and Fidea broke up, she met Patrick. But when Bender found out about their relationship, he began sending threatening texts and voicemails to the couple. 
The couple was granted a restraining order against Bender, in which he was ordered to surrender his collection of guns. For a few months, the threat stopped. That is, until the morning of February 27, 2018, when Vidaire received a call from Bender. She didn't pick up, but was suspicious of why he'd been reaching out again. He started to worry for Patrick's safety and rushed over to his home, but it was too late. She found Patrick dead from a gunshot wound in his driveway. Vidaire immediately suspected Bender, but the police had no evidence to arrest him. Then Bender's soon-to-be ex-wife, Damara Sanchez, sent in a tip. She'd heard about the murder on the news and realized it sounded similar to what she found in one of Bender's notebooks. He had written out a detailed plan of how he would kill Patrick and had drawn a map of his property, indicating how he would go about undetected. When she confronted Bender about what she'd found, he said the notes were just a fantasy. After receiving this information from Demara, the police had probable cause to search Bender's home. Almost immediately, they found the plan and map in a trash can. Just as Demara described, Although the murder weapon was never located, police found ammunition and a shell casing that matched those at the crime scene in Bender's home. According to prosecutors, Benders lured Patrick to the front door by calling him from a burner phone, pretending to be a delivery man and saying that he had a package for him. When Patrick opened the door, Bender fired. Bender was arrested in connection to Patrick's murder and did not take the stand during the trial. On May 28, 2021, after two hours of jury deliberation, he was found guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Patrick de la Cerda. He is currently serving a life prison with no possibility of parole. Now, I would like to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? This last year has been a roller coaster in so many ways, and it is totally normal to work on those emotional twists and turns. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating in as little as 48 hours. It is super easy. You take a quick questionnaire and get matched to one of BetterHelp's network of over 20,000 therapists. It is available to clients worldwide, and they do their best to match you with someone as locally as possible. You can log into your account anytime and message your therapist. In addition to the messaging, you can schedule weekly video sessions or phone sessions so you don't have to sit in a waiting room or commute to an appointment. BetterHelp is committed to helping you find the perfect someone you are comfortable with, and it is free and easy to change therapists if necessary. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional in-office therapy, and financial aid is available if needed. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. BetterHelp is not a crisis line, it isn't self-help, it is a way to get professional therapy done securely online. Check out my link betterhelp.com TCM and use my code TCM to get 10% off your first month and get started today. That is betterhelp.com TCM to get 10% off. Join over 2 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of experienced professionals. Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Number 3. Helen Cardwell In 1992, Helen Cardwell was ready to start fresh. The 35-year-old had just moved to Niles, Texas from West Virginia and was living at the Leaning Tower YMCA. She was about to start a new job as a technician at the Lutheran General Hospital. But when her sister came to visit her on November 7, 1992, she found Helen strangled to death in her room. The police were never able to identify a suspect, but were able to gather DNA samples from the crime scene. Eventually, the case went cold. In 2020, Niles Police Department formed a cold case team dedicated to solving Helen's murder. Using modern forensic technology previously unavailable to them, they were able to extract a DNA profile from samples found at the crime scene and matched it to a now 72-year-old man named Richard Sisto. Sisto had been living in the Niles area at the time of Helen's murder, though police wouldn't say if there was a known connection between the two. But even though police were able to identify Sisto as a suspect, they had a hard time locating him until a search in a police database revealed he was already in custody for a parole violation in Harris County, Texas. 
In August of 2021, police traveled to Harris County to interview Sisto and collect another DNA sample, and in October, he was charged with the murder of Helen Cardwell. Helen's sister Noka expressed her gratitude to the Niles police, saying, I'm so grateful that they decided to reopen this case, and I just appreciate everyone's efforts in solving her murder. Number 4. Mary Pryor in 1997, her body was found beaten, suffocated, and raped in a swampy area just behind her house. I kept an obituary on my desk for decades, so I never lost focus. When you lose a loved one in such a brutal manner, it never goes away from your mind. And the only way we can try to provide some peace of mind is through the courtroom, the presentation of the evidence, and hopefully a conviction. Next, a probable cause conference with Burr's defense lawyers, followed by a preliminary examination. For WNEM-TV5, I'm Kendall Keyes. The Genesee County Sheriff's Office has arrested a longtime suspect in the 1997 homicide of Mary Pryor. 80-year-old Mary was a fixture in her town of Lennon, Michigan. She went to Mass six times a week and visited the same cafe for lunch and dinner every day, which made her murder all the more shocking to the community. On February 27, 1997, Mary's brother called the police after visiting Mary's home and finding the door ajar. Her beloved dog inside, but no signs of Mary. Her body was discovered around 2 p.m. that day, wrapped in a blanket in a swampy area behind her home. She had been sexually assaulted and beaten, and the perpetrator was never found. In 2002, Genese County Sheriff Chris Swanson was assigned to the case. He'd kept a copy of Mary's obituary on his desk to make sure he never forgot his mission. In 2004, he interviewed a suspect named Michael Burr, who was a junior in high school at the time of Mary's murder. Though Burr couldn't be arrested at the time due to lack of evidence, they were able to get a DNA sample from him. Swanson told him that next time he saw him, he'd be in shackles and charged with murder. And in November of 2021, that promise came true. Thanks to technological advances in DNA testing, investigators were able to compare the DNA collected from the crime scene to the DNA collected from Burr, and it was a 1 in 1.9 octillion match. Burr since has been charged with murder, criminal sexual conduct in the first degree, and kidnapping. Number 5. Jessica Gutierrez It has been 35 years since 4-year-old Jessica Gutierrez was taken from her home in Lexington County, North Carolina, and now the man responsible for her disappearance and murder has been charged. On the night of June 5, 1987, Jessica was sleeping in her room with her 6-year-old sister, Becky. But when their mother, Deborah, woke up the next morning, Jessica was nowhere to be found. The room was littered with paper, the front door was open, and the curtains were torn off the window. Becky told her mother that Jessica had been taken by the man with the magic hat and beard. Their mother then called the local law enforcement, who conducted an unsuccessful search of the area. Investigators determined that someone had broken into their home and had taken Jessica before leaving out the front door. A single fingerprint was found on the windowsill of the bedroom. The fingerprint was later matched to a longtime family acquaintance, Thomas McDowell, after he was convicted of a rape in 1987. He served 10 years in prison for the rape and was released in 1997, and still remained a suspect in Jessica's disappearance. During his time in prison, McDowell allegedly confessed to a cellmate that he'd kidnapped a girl in Lexington County, and that he'd been wearing a tall cowboy hat at the time. The cellmate reported the information to the police, who repeatedly searched the landfill but found nothing. Authorities questioned McDowell, who offered to confess to the crime in exchange for immunity from prosecution, but that was denied. At the time, there wasn't sufficient evidence to prosecute McDowell for the crime. But in 2020, the Lexington County Sheriff's Office cold case team took another look at Jessica's case with the help of the FBI, analysis from the Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Team, and prosecutors from the South Carolina Attorney General's Office. Attorney General Alan Wilson said newly discovered information helped them confirm McDowell was the perpetrator. 
Jessica's mother, Deborah Gutierrez, was relieved her daughter's killer has finally been caught. I'm glad God brought me to see it, she said. I prayed he would bring me through it, and we've waited for this a long time. In January of 2022, McDowell was taken into custody and charged with kidnapping, first-degree burglary, and the murder of Jessica Gutierrez, who is still missing and presumed dead. He is currently being held at the Wake County Detention Center without bail. It's one step closer to uh, answers and justice for my sister. My family and I, like, we really don't believe that, like, the streets are safe with, with this caliber man um, walking them freely. Number six, Marissa Rolf Harvey. Marissa Rolf Harvey was 15 years old when she found out she had a half sister. She had been adopted when she was three and was living with her family in New York when one day in December of 1977, her newfound sibling showed up at her door. Marissa was thrilled about the discovery and begged her parents to let her visit her sister in San Francisco in the coming spring. They reluctantly agreed and she flew to the city during her Easter break, arriving on March 24, 1978. She spent the weekend with her sister and on Monday asked to go horseback riding, which was one of her favorite hobbies. Her friend's sister dropped her off at the Golden Gate Park stables, but they were closed and Marissa was left stranded and alone. When Marissa didn't return home to her sister's apartment later that day, she called the police and reported her missing. The next day, a man found Marissa's body in Sutro Heights Park, less than half a mile away from the stables. According to the coroner, Marissa had been badly beaten and strangled to death. The San Francisco Police Department conducted an exhaustive investigation, but ultimately could not identify a suspect in Marissa's murder. Then, in October 2020, the department's cold case unit reopened Marissa's case. Supported by advanced technology from the department's Forensic Science Division, the police identified a suspect, 76-year-old Mark Stanley Personet, from Conifer, Colorado. On December 15, 2021, Personet was arrested by Jefferson County Sheriff's Office in Colorado and held without bail on the charge of being a fugitive of justice. His criminal record included aggravated sexual assault, and the San Francisco Police Department is asking other law enforcement agencies to review similar cold cases in which Personet may be a suspect. Number 7. Rosemarie Monez Investigators in Connecticut have solved a 2001 cold case after re-examining a conch shell used in the murder. This was the scene on March 24, 2001, a New Bedford neighborhood on edge after a woman was found murdered inside her Cushnet Avenue home. The police received a 911 call in our communications center in regards to an unresponsive female uh, on a floor. Rosemary Monez of New Bedford, Connecticut, was found dead in her home on March 23, 2001, when her father stopped by to pick her up for a doctor's appointment. The 41-year-old had been beaten to death with a fireplace poker, a conch shell, and a cast iron fireplace kettle. Since her purse had been emptied out onto the floor and money was missing, police initially assumed it was a robbery, but there were no signs of forced entry. After ruling out two suspects, the case went unsolved for almost two decades. Then in 2019, the Bristol County's District Attorney's Office and Massachusetts State Police Unsolved Crime Unit reopened the case. Investigators reviewed photos of abrasions and contusions on the victim's face, and they were caused by the conch shell's exterior and determined that the perpetrator had to have put his fingers inside the conch shell to strike the victim. When they re-examined the conch shell and tested it for DNA, they found a full profile. They uploaded the profile to the National DNA Database and it led to a match. It was Rose's half-brother, David Reed, who was a pallbearer at her funeral. Reed's DNA was already in the database after a 2003 assault and robbery of a different New Bedford woman. He had been arrested and charged for the crime, but he never showed up to trial. In August of 2020, investigators interviewed Reed about Rose's murder. Soon after, he fled his home in Massachusetts and evaded authorities for the next year, 
by traveling across the country. He was eventually located and arrested on September 10, 2021, while he was staying at the Providence, Rhode Island Mission Shelter. In November, he was indicted on charges of murder and armed robbery in connection with Rose's death. He's currently awaiting arraignment. The effort that goes into these cases is extraordinary. This isn't resolved in a weekend or a week. Um, so again, it's a combination of old-fashioned police work with DNA testing that has resulted in this defendant being charged with the murder. We look forward to prosecuting him in court. Number 8. Minner Lee Soriano on February 24, 1999, Minner Lee Soriano, known as Minnie to friends and family, disappeared. That day, the 13-year-old left school as usual and was heading to her home in the Bronx, but she never made it. 13-year-old Minner Lee Soriano, who went by Minnie in 1999, was on her way home in Co-op City when she was sexually abused and strangled. Three days after she went missing, her body was discovered in a dumpster in the Bronx, dumped like trash. Eyewitness News reporter Sandra Bookman in 1999. Police spent much of yesterday looking through the trash at this video store here at the Bay Plaza shopping complex in the Baychester section of the Bronx. Her mother reported her missing that night and soon after the community began searching for her, putting out flyers with a large reward for information. Four days later, a homeless man found her body wrapped in a trash bag inside a dumpster behind a video store. She had been strangled and there were signs of sexual abuse. Authorities questioned family members, neighbors, classmates, and teachers, and conducted a nearly year-long investigation, but found no leads. DNA samples were gathered and submitted for tracing with no success. For years, the case went unsolved until 2020, when police used familial DNA technology to crack it. A DNA sample taken from semen found on the victim's sweater was submitted to New York's convicted offender DNA database, and they found a partial match. They built out a family tree based on the results and narrowed down their suspects to three relatives, one of whom was a man named Joseph Martinez. When they reviewed the evidence from the case again, they discovered that Martinez was a tenant at Minnie's apartment building during 1999. They also had notes from the initial investigation quoting Martinez saying that he remembered seeing Minnie around the building. In recent years, Martinez became known as Jupiter Joe, a sidewalk astronomer who would set up his telescope on New York City sidewalks and offer viewings and many lessons about the stars to kids. Nobody from her family and none of Minnie's friends remember Martinez, but police say he lived in Co-op City in 1999. Police say he was living all these years in New Rochelle, in plain sight, living a public life, calling himself Jupiter Joe. A YouTube video shows him in public places, teaching astronomy to children. If I told you my name was Joe Martinez, would you remember it? In Minnie's notebooks, investigators found lists of astronomy-related websites, as it was something she was also interested in. Investigators collected a DNA sample from Martinez, and it was a match to the DNA found on the sweater. In November of 2021, he was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. He pleaded not guilty to the charges and is due back in court on March 7, 2022. This case marks the first time familial DNA technology has been used to solve a cold case in New York City. I hope that she sees all the people that cared, all the people that put in so much effort over so many years, eating meals off the dashboard of a car, and that she, uh, that she knows she wasn't forgotten. Well, that is it for this video. Thank you so much to BetterHelp for sponsoring. Let me know what you thought of all of these and if you would like to see more roundups in the future. If you like this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. And if you could give a like if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated. We also have channel membership as well as Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content as well as exclusive content or just support the channel. In the description box of this video, you will also find all my socials, links so that you can connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you all so much for being here. I will see you on the next one. Bye for now.